चैप्टर में हमने कुछ क्वेश्चन ऐसे किए थे कि जिसमें हमारे पास कंप्लीट कम्बस्टन इक्वेशन में वी नीड टू फाइंड आउट दून कंपाउंड इन द फॉर्मूला टर्न आउट टू बी दिस but that wasn't an alkene that was very confusing we're talking about uh, the questions related to chapter 2 of the book now if this is it but it's not an alkene it's probably a cyclooalkane this is what this connects to from the previous chapters all right so let's keep moving on since this is a simple example and they actually discuss the three subtypes position functional group and chain they're very simple position isomerism is the one in which the functional group is same but its position over the chain is different for example we can talk about this <coughs> now this is dipropenene sorry propane dipropropane now if you look at the formula there are four possible isomers that you're going to see over here if i properly number them and connect it with nomenclature it would be easier for you to understand and i'm going to explain a principle after making my point this is one this is two as per numbering you can start the numbering from either side in this case in this case the numbering has to start from the left in this case the numbering can start from the either side so now when you look at it you'd see that this is one one dibromo propane right and in every case we have the dibromo one propane because this is one sorry one more two thank you so this is c3 h4 no 1 2 3 4 5 6 yeah h6 br2 this is the molecular formula for all of these this is one two dibromo propane this is one three dibromo propane this is one one dibromopropane and this is two two dibromopropane and there are four possible out isomers and this is the example of a very good example of position isomerism it's just the position of bromine atom which is different for different carbon atoms which actually changes uh, some of the physical as well as possibility of some of the chemical properties <laughs> now this seems really easy to understand let's connect it to what cambridge does to manipulate these kind of questions the first and foremost question which have been posed in papers like 2008 to 2013 or probably 2006 to 2013 is that why do One two and one three exist, but two three dibromopropane does not exist. The second question being one one and two two exist, but why don't three three exist? Yeah, that's correct. They don't exist, but what's the reason? Go ahead, try answering the question. It's past paper question actually. So my clinical room. Uh, that applies if you're making it out of an alkene. If you're not making it out of an alkene, then what would you say? Parent chain needs to be the least number of carbon atom. I I didn't get it. Can you repeat? Can I? So can I tell you? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So in three three it can't be because it will be the same as one one because the naming starts from the area from the functional group. Right. And three three does not exist because as per the naming rules, this won't apply. And instead, this is just one one. What about two three? Two three also. Same for two three. Three one two. Yeah, it won't exist because this would be then this one. The nomenclature rule says that wherever the branch or the functional group is nearest, we we'll start numbering from that side, and that can be the either side. It can be we can start numbering from top or from bottom or from left or from right. It doesn't really matter. But uh, what we actually propose, what 
the rules propose is that you go with the lowest possible number. That's fine. Which gives us the idea that there are four possible isomers, position isomers for this one. Okay. And those are these four. Make sense? Yes, sir. Good. Yes, sir. Moving further. Now, in order to clarify, he gives a very good idea about it. How the structure can be manipulated, right? And these are all 1,2-dibromopropane. This one is 1,2-dibromopropane. This one is 1,2-dibromopropane. This one is 1,2-dibromopropane. Okay. The idea behind it is free rotation of carbon-carbon single bonds. Free rotation means that if some students write Br over here for first carbon atom, and another student instead write H over here and Br over here, this would be the same thing taken as correct. A third student writes H over here and Br over here, he or she would also be correct. So there are three possibilities. This is known as free rotation. You can rotate this specific functional group on the same carbon atom and write it at whichever position you want to. But this you can only do with carbon-carbon single bonds. You won't be able to repeat the same with carbon-carbon double bonds, which we're going to study further. I hope you understand the point, right? Now, yes, this one is the same thing. Now, this one is just a manipulation of how we are writing the structure. Instead of continuing it further over here and writing bromine up top and carbon over here, or bromine at bottom, carbon over here, uh, they instead wrote it at bottom. So. What we are supposed to do is to find out the parent chain like this. This would be one, this would be two, this would be three. Again, one, two, that from a propane. So I hope this clarifies it. Moving on, function group isomerism. Pretty easy, two different functional groups, same molecular formula, but entirely different structures because entirely different function groups. Of course, this means that the naming would be different. The naming would be entirely different in terms of prefixes, either or suffixes. Now notice, I specifically am mentioning this point because you need to understand the whole setup of the position isomers was that the number was different. It was one, two, then this was one, three, then this was one, one, then this was two, two, but the rest of the name, dipronopropane, was similar in all four parts, which clearly tells us that the, the, this is position isomerism because just the numbers are different, rest everything else the same. Now, clarifying or comparing it with functional group isomerism, since the entire functional group changes, the whole setup of name changes. Now, this one is an alcohol, and alcohols have suffixes of all, so it's named this way, and this one is an ether, since we don't explain ether in your chapters, but a point that you automatically get is that we do put oxy in there because of the oxygen right in the center of two carbon chains. So yeah, oxy is there. So the way we write their names, whether that's a prefix or that is a suffix that's supposed to be at the ce center or start or at the end of the name, this would automatically change. But again, this has to have the same molecular formula, which in this case is C3H8O, but different structure. And of course, because of different function group, they would have entirely different physical and chemical properties. This one shows maximum amount of change because everything changes with function group. All right, moving on. Chain isomerism. In chain isomerism, the structure of carbon skeleton is different. Okay, so for example, we're talking about this one. Okay, so in this case, one of them is straight chain, one of them is broad chain. So the name would be different. Also in this case, sometimes the name completely changes. All right, chain isomerism 
in a few past papers, and I'm talking about specifically before 2014, was experienced for questions in which the function group is supposed to be in the exact center. For example, the function group such as ketone is actually in the center of two carbon chains over here or here. Now the length of this carbon chain, length of this carbon chain can be different. Now this sometimes confuses students with position isomerism as well, because uh, this is the position of the function group and it can be the third carbon, it can be the fourth carbon, so on and so forth. But it was a part of previous chain isomerism because we discussed this carbon as a part of the chain. Of course, in counting. Well, confusing questions like these don't come anymore. We only tell students because when they are solving any question beyond 2014 or 2012, they don't get confused with it. So now for your papers, you won't question, get questions like these. Even if you do, remember, whether you put it at position or whether you put it at chain, both ways you're gonna get be correct. So I hope that isn't uh, a big problem. Okay, this also finishes up structural isomerism. Any questions from structural isomerism before we move forward? No, sir. Okay, stereoisomerism. Mm -hmm. Now, stereoisomerism is different. We have the same molecular formula, we have the same structural formula, but the arrangement of atoms in space is different. So previously what was different in uh, structural isomerism is going to be same over here with the difference of arrangement of atoms in space. Now there are two types. The first one is known as geometrical as well as cis -trans. These are the two names of the same kind of isomerism. The second one is optical. Now this one requires more work because there are many things that can be manipulated as questions in organic chemistry. And they usually take one or two marks question out of it. They may take more, but this is the least they do every season, every year. Be that paper one, paper two, or they sometimes even manipulate these kind of questions for paper three as well. Analytical text considered. All right, so geometrical or cis trans isomerism. Unlike a carbon-carbon double bond, there is no free rotation. If you're going to rotate it, it is going to result in a different isomer. Now, how do we go with geometrical or cis trans isomerism? It's pretty easy. When both of them are up top, or both of them are at bottom, or when they make a cross. Now, the up top and bottom are the childish words we use to explain it. Okay, this is not what you're supposed to write in exams. What you're supposed to write in exams aren't even the words like uh, diagonals. Sometimes teacher use the word diagonals to re represent these. Yeah, the cross sign means the diagonals, but don't even use these. This is not the way we use our language for organic chemistry. How do we use it? On the same side of carbon, carbon double bond is cis, right? Position across the carbon carbon double bond is trans. Pick this phrase, use this phrase every time you want to explain what cis or what trans is. Same side means top, right, and bottom. Okay, and across means diagonals or cross position. It's fine, whichever one you understand. But you don't use these words in exams, all right? Now, clarification. Same side can never mean this or this, right? This is not a geometrical or cis trans isomerism. It's neither of these examples. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, since you can't look at me and I can't really explain it with the help of using hands or fingers, which most commonly teachers do around the world. So try and understand if we want to convert cis into trans, you pick up a pair and you shift the positions like this. And you can pick any pair. 
either the one on the left or the one on the right. Okay. In this case, he shifted these actually. He shifted this one over here and this one over here. That's why we're saying no free rotation. As soon as we shifted them, the cis converted it to trans or the trans converted into cis. So there is no free rotation. The rotation actually changes the isomer. So do remember the point of the left and right. Okay. Now, what makes it more difficult is the type of atoms. Now, this was really the easiest example on the planet. Both the atoms up top were the same. Both the atoms at the bottom were the same. And now this example, if I pick it and I correlate it with this one, this actually conforms with this one, AA and PB. What if we have three different atoms, A, B, and D? What if we have four different atoms, A, B, E, and D? How are we going to put it then? Okay, let's solve the easier one first. Let's do it with an example. Make sense? This is what it yeah. may look like. This is one of the examples. There are hundreds or thousands of examples that Cambridge can come up with. Now this is AA and BD. How do you clarify? If you're sitting in exams and you have, have atoms or group of atoms over here, because it can't, can be anything. It can really be anything. It can be a CH3, this CH3, or these, okay? Now, when this happens, we can actually bifurcate A's, B, and D based upon MR, or based upon, specifically, MR is used to solve this one. Okay, this one's easy. If you switch any one of these, right, the A's become on diagonal and the B and D become another diagonal. So it's this one is really easy to solve. So I'm not gonna spend more time on this one since you can easily do it. I hope you can, if you can't, let me know now. Now is the time. Now, if I talk about this one, and I'm going to take a, an example over here. Let's say we have it like this one, F, CL, PR, then how are we going to work it? There are two ways to work it, okay? First thing is that you base them upon MR, both smaller up top, both heavier at the bottom. Remember, hydrogen is one, this one is, I guess, 19, this one is 35.5. I might not be exact up to one decimal figure as per your book is, uh, I guess this is 79.9, right? But this is so far what I remember from your periodic table, okay? So both smaller up top, both heavier at the bottom. That is one way to put it. When one smaller and one heavier comes across, that would definitely become a trance. You can switch either side, either the lifts or the rights. That is one way to put it. The second way to put it is whichever examiner gives you as an ultimate structure you just take that structure up and use it towards without considering whether there is a difference of MR or not, just switch the sides and convert it into trans. If the question is not about justifying it or making a structure yourself, you can take whatever example the examiner has given you and work upon it accordingly without thinking about the MRs. Now this really depends upon the scenario of the question. If you're supposed to conform a structure, form a structure yourselves, go with the MR rule that is most beneficial because it keeps everything easier for you. But if you are ultimately already given with a structure and you're supp just supposed to manipulate it, convert it into an isomer, switch one of the either sides, either the left or the right, and go accordingly with the question. I hope I make my point clear. Are we? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, again, keep in mind that this, my bad, is not a cis 
or a trans isomerism. Let's call it a D. Because these are two sides together is not geometric or cis trans. This is not even an example. Okay. Other portions, why there is no free rotation? Pi bond, carbon carbon double bond. Also, stereoisomers can have different chemical properties. They may have different rates of reaction. All right. Other important points. Limited rotation, that makes up rings, usually do the same in cyclic compounds. Now, let's work with that. Now, cyclic compounds. This is not even a compound with pi bonds. This is just cyclic. Now, the rotation becomes limited. As soon as it does, it gives us cis and trans isomers. How? Let's take a look at it. This one and this one, this one and this one. Now, I hope you understand if we use straight lines, that means they're in the plane, in the 2D plane, that means two-dimensional length and width plane. Wherever we use a wedge, this old colored wedge, right? It means sticking uh, out of the plane. The proper term that the book use. Uh, in 3D situation, the easier words that we commonly use is that moving towards you. All right, but I suggest you don't use the words towards you or away from you. You use the words sticking out of the plane or for dotted line, maybe even for dotted wedge, right? You use the words sticking into the plane. And if you look at a 3D movie in a 3D cinema, right? Uh, then this is the one that we usually call away from you. Okay, now notice, even if there are no pi bonds, it's a cyclic structure because of the limited rotation towards you, towards you, towards you, away from you. Cis trans. This one's cis because both of them are same. This one's trans. How we can further explain it? He has taken the exact same structures over here. Now, both CH3 and OH points upwards out of the paper and both CH3 uh, points upwards, whereas OH points downwards, which means one of them is out of the paper, CH3, one of them is into the paper, OH, hence cis trans. One of them is cis, one of them is trans. I hope you get the point. Are we clear? Now these are exact same structures. Yes. They may write this one, they may write this one. And they usually are a part of paper one and two. They have, Cambridge has been using them uh, real a lot lately. Okay, let's take another example. The previous one was a pentagon. This one is actually a tetragon. Okay, so if you look at it, this is the same kind. And tells us about the same for cis and trans isomer. Though the function group they have been using is different in the example up top and over here, but it gives the same idea about the wedges or the dotted lines. Good enough? Yes. Sir. Yes. All right. Moving on. Optical isomerism. The second subtype of stereoisomerism. Now, there are many things we need to learn about this one. For optical isomerism, if a molecule contains carbon atom that is bonded to four different atoms or group of atoms, like you can look at this one. This carbon atom is bonded to four different atoms or group of atoms. One of them is hydrogen, one of them is alcohol, one of them is a methyl group, one of them is a carboxylic group. We can describe this carbon atom as asymmetric or chiral, it can be called as a chiral center. It can also be called as a chiral carbon. And these two structures will then be enantiomers. Why they're optical isomers? Why? Because if we put up a mirror plane, they're exact, they're images of one another. Now, again, images of one another means they can't be superimposed. Means I pick this entire structure up 
And if I write the structure over here, we have C over CH3. Yeah, I'm superimposing it. But as soon as I come up with this one, we have OH over here and we have H over here. Can't be superimposed. And we have a wedge over here, right? And we have CO2H over here. So actually, the left and the right of them are switching. For example, he and we usually tell it in the same uh, way. Uh, well, a good YouTube video can work uh, much better than my simple explanation over here. That if you put your left hand on top of your right hand, both of them are facing downwards, then both of the thumbs will stick out. Like sometimes, usually the trotters try to make fish out of their hands. They would keep swinging both the uh, thumbs and both hand, hands are on the top and bottom of one another, both face downwards. I hope you get the point, right? So what we do is that we discuss about them. Now, optical isomers differ in the effect of polarized light. Now, this is something that we need to explain. Now, polarized and unpolarized lights, uh, uh, light are, or the kind of wavelength we are talking about is something that comes right out of physics. Normal light that we talk about can consist of hundreds, thousands, millions of wavelengths at the same time. Now, that is unpolarized light. Polarized light is a light of single wavelength, only light of the, which has one wavelength type. So what we do is that we take normal light and polarized light, we put a polarizer in its path and it converts it into polarized light. How? It only allows one single wavelength to pass and it blocks the rest. Now, this pair of optical isomers, when plane of polarized light pass through them, right, they actually rotate the plane in equal amounts, but in opposite directions. For example, I'm gonna go back, clear this one up. If we put plane polarized light on this one and on this one, one of them is going to rotate it in the same amount clockwise, and one of them is going to rotate it in the same amount anti-clockwise. Hence, they're optical isomers. Now, you must be thinking, why have, been we, why have we been trying to pass a polarized light out of them and they just simply rotate it? What does that have to do with chemistry? Now, this is not exactly explained in this chapter or the AS part of the book. Well, when you'll get to the last chapter of A2, we'll tell you that if one of them rotates it clockwise and one of them rotates it anti-clockwise, this means these isomers are probably going to give you entirely different uh, chemical or biochemical or even medicinal properties. They're going to discuss a few isomers in the last chapter or the second last chapter of the same book we are at. And they're going to tell you that one of these optical isomers and enantiomers is a very good uh, cancer treating agent and the other one even does not have the capability to treat cancer instead gives you a kidney stone imagine one of them has such a good medicinal effect that it can treat cancer and the other one which can just rotate light at a different angle if the previous one was doing it clockwise it would simply be doing it anti-clockwise but has no medicinal properties as per the previous one we discussed, instead, it gives you a bigger problem, a kidney stone. There is an example at the end of the book. Now, this is how much it differentiates. It's literally the same thing, just a mirror image of it, inverted left and right, right? So organic molecules can contain more than one asymmetric carbon atom, and this line is very important. More than one chiral center if there are two asymmetric carbon atoms present. Now, this we need to practice. And I am going to take you a few pages back in order to practice it. I usually tend to practice it on a very big molecule. There is one up top that we can use to our advantage. I guess I'll find it up top. 
Yeah, this one. This is a cholesterol molecule, the infamous cholesterol that when gets into arteries or veins gives us heart problems, may even kill a person, right? Now, this is a combined structural 3D and skeletal formula. Some parts are drawn in skeletal. For example, if you look at this part, this is drawn skeletal. These parts with wedges and dotted portions are actually 3D. And the rest of these portions, the simple portions, are simple structural portions. Now, if you look at it, you'll find many carbon atoms over here. A common question that's not P2, that's exactly P1, would ask you how many chiral carbons are there? My simple question is how many chiral carbons? They may use the word the asymmetric carbons. They may use the word chiral center. So you need to count them. Now, what I tell my students is that don't try counting every chiral carbon because this is going to take too long. What you're supposed to do is to eliminate the ones that are not chiral. Now, let me tell you, any carbon that is triply bonded is not a chiral carbon. Any carbon that is doubly bonded is not a chiral carbon. Any carbon that has H3, like this one does, is not a chiral carbon. Any carbon which is CH2 and has bonds on both sides, for example, this one has a single line bond over here and single line bond over here, is not a chiral carbon. All right? So, which one is a chiral carbon? Only the carbon that has four different atoms or group of atoms uh, on each side is can be considered as a chiral carbon. Remember this example that we discussed previously. So now what you need to do is to start from one side, try considering every carbon atom in there, try eliminating the options which are not chiral, and then you can simply count the ones that are chiral. Okay, I'm going to turn on the annotations. Would one of you like to practice it with me? Okay. You sure? Go ahead. Uh, annotation is on. Use a different color, not black. And try putting up the numbers and keep telling and talking at the same time which one is chiral, why not? Discuss all of yes. them. I did. The OH one is for the first one. Second one is sorry, the CH3. This sec blow the CH3, it will be the chiral carbon. Mm -hmm. Let's continue. That I want to, yes. That's it? So I think, yeah. Okay, let's let it be there. Uh, Laiba, would you like to try or would you like me to explain? Sir, would you explain? Yeah, okay. What you're supposed to do is to start from one side, keep eliminating the ones with reason, and whichever one you suspect, keep Put them there. All right. So let's try it like this. I'm going to use a different color. Now, this is a carbon. Okay. And this carbon has OH on one side, of course, H on the other. And we have this whole portion, which is different set of bondings. We have a single bonded carbon, a single bonded carbon, and then a double bond, single bonded, single bonded, single bond. So definitely this side and this whole side is different. So this carbon is chiral carbon, which means about this red sign, Saad was right all along. Make sense? Okay, yes. so we measured every side. I'm gonna redo it and let's go with it in another one. Okay, take a look at this one. This one has a single bond over here, single bond over here. This is this type. Cross it out. Single bond on this side, single bond on this side, cross it out. Why? 
because if a carbon has single bond over here, single bond over here, it must have two hydrogen. And as soon as you see it has two sets of same elements on the same side, it's not a chiral carbon. It has to be four different bonds. So this one is a cross. Now let's keep crossing the ones that are not true. CH3, CH3, CH2, 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 all right, CH2. No, this one is CH. Let's not cross this one. CH3, this one is not right. This one is not right. This one is not right. This one because of single bonds. This one because of single bonds is not right. This one is not right. This one is not right. We can try the rest. Now, you quickly eliminated all of these. Now, there is a double bonded there. Sadhpro is just probably talking about this one. So both the doubly bonded carbon atoms are not a part of it. This one is also not a part of it. Now we are left with a few. A few of them has already been marked by Saad. Some of them Saad left. So let's discuss all of them, whether Saad marked it or not. Let's start talking about this one. If I talk about this one in here, there is one bond over here, which goes to a different sense because there is a double bond ahead. There is one whole side which has different rings and one whole side over here with different rings. And up top, we have CH3. So yeah, this one is correct. So I did it right. Now, then there is this one. A different ring over here, different ring over here, different ring over here, and an H over here. This is also correct. Okay. Now let's talk about this one. A different ring over here, different ring over here, different rings or different paths over here, since the atoms don't meet up, and then H up top, so yeah, Sad was right about this one. Again, the H, different sides of ring, a pentagon over here, a hexagon over here. Up top, we have CH3 over here. So yeah, this one was is also correct. So is this one. So is this one. Because a methyl group, a whole long chain, a set of rings, and a hydrogen. Okay. This one is also correct. Hydrogen, a pentagon side, a side connected to hexagons, and a whole long chain up top. So if I count them, and this time I'm going to use a different color. Okay, so this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six, this is seven, this is eight. Get the point? Yes, sir. So these take some time. And you need to practice this. And you're going to find many questions like this in past papers. You're going to easily find up to six to eight different questions like this with different big, scary structures. But if you know how to count chiral carbons, chiral centers, asymmetric carbons, all mean the same thing, you can easily do it. Remember, to always eliminate the wrong choices first. And in order to recheck the question, if you started off from this side in the first attempt, start off from this side during rechecking. Always recheck a question like this for both eliminated carbons and possible chiral centers. Make sense? Yes, sir. And this question, we don't have to check students who are foreign check. Don't do it once, take one option, see? At the end of the paper, when you ask two or three questions, do it from fresh mind from the other side. Keep an arrow marked on the side you started off with in the first end, so that you can go with a different side in the second end. Okay? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir but you might eradicate your own errors, all right? So this was one of the points. Let's get back to where we were. So the page we were discussing this. Okay, so organic molecules can contain more than one chiral carbon, of course, each of these chiral centers will rotate the plane of polarized light in different ways. Of course, there would be two possible options. And if there are two chiral centers, let's say two asymmetric carbons, 
there would be four possible optical isomers. If there are three, there would be more. So this keeps on increasing. The number of isomers that form after seven or eight chiral carbons would be much more than just this, okay? Now, as well as straight and branch chain molecules, substituted also have chiral centers, right? Chiral center ko discuss karne ke liye usne pura ring diya. He has discussed this carbon, this carbon. Okay, as soon as you see this one, this one is not an option, this one, this one, this one, because they're all CH2s. Okay, since two hydrogen are the same, we can either dis dis discuss this one or this one. And he has completely discussed that I was talking about here is chain and here is another chain. He has discussed it. He has discussed it in a very good form. H atom, OH atom, this kind of group, this kind of group. So if you go from one side to the other side, then you will go. So finally, he has told this cyclic molecule has two chiral centers. One that is attached directly to OH, one that is attached directly to the mine group. All right. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yes. Good. So that actually finishes this one up.